All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of the day. You are the all-stars that made it here. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, relationship counseling session of Unite Europe. Um, today, uh, we're going to go over uh, some, of the, some of the UI systems in Unity. Um, this is the story of you and I. I'm Jesse Smith. I'm a field engineer with Unity based out of Chicago. And I'm Philip Cosgrave. I'm the lead UI developer um, that basically owns this product. So why are we here today? We're here because we, we heard about this awesome thing. We waited a long time for it. Uh, we, we, you know, we hoped and we prayed and we, we suffered delays before we saw it. And we just kind of imagined what it would be like to, to see it, to touch it, to push its buttons. Of course, we're talking about UGUI, Unity's UI system. So the first, I'm going to start off by letting Phil go over some of, oh, sorry, this is the agenda. I forgot I threw that in there so you guys all know what we'd be, we'd be doing today. Uh, so we're going to go over the history of UGUI, where it came from, where it lives, um, the basic components of UGUI for anyone in here that's not uh, used it too much. Actually, raise your hand if you've never used our new UI system. A couple of hands, most people know. OK, so yeah, we're going to go over some of the basic components just so everyone's kind of on the same page. Uh, we're going to go over some more advanced components, uh, layouts, and other useful things that you can use. Uh, we're going to cover UI scripting uh, in the editor and in code, uh, and how to extend the UGUI project and uh, add to it or, or change it to make it suit your needs. And then, of course, at the end, we're going to have a little Q&A. Uh, so keep your questions in mind, and uh, someone will come around with a microphone at the end. So chapter one in our relationship counseling session, introductions. So any, any relationship starts off with an introduction. It's, it's a friend that tells you about someone or you meet at a party, and you always ask those, those initial questions. You know, where are you from? Where do you live? Uh, how do you scale? Are you performant? Uh, the normal stuff that everybody needs to know. Uh, and to go through that, I'm going to allow Phil to take over. Yeah, so the development of UGUI started, oh, probably when I was hired back in 2013. Um, and then from there, there was a base that was shown at Unite, I don't know, guess, 2011. Um, when I started, we tried to extend that base and actually get it ready for shipping. That did not go to plan. But four <laughs> months after we started, we took that code base, threw it out the window, and started from scratch. Um, it relied on things like nested prefabs, which, as you know, are still not there. Uh, so obviously, we couldn't use it. We needed to start it from scratch. Uh, we finally got around to releasing it in November of 2014 um, in Unity 4.6. Uh, and as you probably all know, we have it on the open source Bitbucket repo. But we can go into that a little bit more later. Um, so really, basic considerations when you're picking any mate, partnership, anything like that, is their appearance, frankly. Um, it's the first thing you look at before you even introduce yourself. Um, but with UI, we're talking more about images, raw images, and text. So these are the three fundamental components that you guys have visibility on for the UI system. These are what give you rendering capabilities of your images, um, your text, and the difference between image and raw image. Images are sprites. Uh, for any of you that have used the 2D system, it's the exact same system. So it's a sprite that, if there's a packing tag on it at runtime or build time, it will actually create a sprite atlas for you. Raw image, on the other hand, is a texture all on its own. This can be anything from a render texture to just a texture that you don't want Atlas for some reason. Um, and text, I will be completely honest with you, our text solution is not great at the moment. It's there, it's functional, it does most of the things you want, but we are working on actually improving it. So take that question right off <laughs> the table for the end. And there are asset store packages that And there are, are asset store packages that will actually make it really nice. Um, the next consideration is interactions. 
you start pushing each other's buttons. <laughs> so in our case, there's buttons, there's toggles, there's sliders, there's scroll views, there's basically anything else. Um, for this, we are actually adding more components as well. We're working on windows, tabs, uh, tooltips, kind of basic things that are still missing, but at the same time, there's packages available as well. The next interaction you tend to do is you hide yourself a little bit from your partner, just off the bat. You don't want to expose yourself too quickly. So, but in the UI case, what I'm talking about here is Mask and Rec Mask 2D. Now, these are actually two different components. Most of you probably know about the Mask because that shipped in 4.6. The Rec Mask 2D is a new feature as of 5.2. Um, and they are fundamentally different. The masks use something called the stencil buffer, which is on the graphics device, where RecMask 2D does clipping in a shader. Uh, for performance reasons, RecMask 2D is actually a lot better than masks, because a lot of mobile devel devices don't support the stencil buffer all that well. Uh, so I would recommend using the RecMask 2D. And I think I'll go into it later. The next basic component of the UI system are the campuses. This is actually what's doing all the work on the back end, batching all your elements together, making things nice and quick. There's three different types. There's the overlay, which is just directly to the graphics device, no extra processing, no lighting. Um, there's the screen space camera, which adjusts the canvas's size to match the frustrum of that camera at the distance from the camera. So if you notice in the scene view, as you're adjusting the distance, the canvas will actually grow and shrink, but that's because it's bound to the frust from size. And if it's a perspective camera, obviously, as you get further away, it gets larger. Then we have world space canvases. These are used thing for things like VR, because you don't want anything attached, basically fixed right on your screen. If you start looking around with a fixed UI on VR, you'll make yourself nauseous. Uh, the other thing that they can be used for is in-world interactions. Say you want a computer console somewhere in your world that's interactable, you can put a world space canvas on it, get all the same functionality, and then make your own little computer and desktop app right inside your application. All right, chapter two, the deets. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get past the introduction phase, uh, you get to know a little bit more about your partner. You notice the, the dimples in their cheeks. Um, or, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, those important things. I don't know. What, what <laughs> OK, nothing about the interface joke. That's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. You learn how to, yeah, never mind. It's <laughs> the moment passed. <laughs> um, so we're going to go over some layouts. Oh, there. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, in Unity, actually, uh, go back up. Yeah. So in Unity, in your UI system, you have horizontal layouts, you have vertical layouts, and you have grid layouts. Um, I'm just going to show those real quick, if we can switch over. Um, show a little example here. All right. So this is a, just a simple horizontal layout. Uh, what's really nice about it is that uh, you can have the elements inside uh, fit to the size of that layout. So say I, I take this button out, I disable it, the other buttons will fill that space. Uh, you can use things like uh, layout elements to say there, there's a minimum size that these buttons can be or these elements can be, um, and a preferred size. So if there's enough space, the elements will fill that much space. But uh, if there's not, it goes down to the minimum. So, there's, uh, so that's the horizontal. You've got vertical, which kind of works the same way, obviously, but vertically. And you have a grid layout. Uh, and in this, you can, you can determine the size of the cells. I can change that and fit more in there. I can uh, move those around. Um, those are the basic layout components. Uh, and beyond that, uh, we have layout elements, which, as I mentioned, will let you specify how small or what's the preferred size of, of the elements. Uh, an aspect, ra aspect ratio fitter, which will preserve your element's aspect ratio uh, even if it gets uh, narrow, it'll, just, it'll adjust the height so that it keeps the same ratio. 
uh, content size fitters, which will fit the parent element to the size of whatever's inside of it, and the canvas scaler, which I will say right now, learn the canvas scaler, use it. Uh, it saved my ass one time. Um, I spent a day and a half trying to uh, create this demo and, and make all the elements in it responsive and, and adjust to the screen size perfectly. And I just couldn't quite get it right. There was always one thing that was off. Uh, and then I used this canvas scaler, and in five minutes, I had everything scaling properly. And you know, that was just my own uh, lack of knowledge there. And I can show you that exact project. So this, this was the canvas. And when I, when I hit play, uh, get this running, um, it's just a simple slot machine-like game. But you can see the, uh, the, the text, the, the bet value and the lines value, like those numbers are really weird. And if I change the resolution, everything just kind of gets smashed and not laid out properly. And so like I said, a day and a half, I was looking at this and racking my brain. How do I fix this? And then I used the canvas scaler. And as you can see here, it's set to scale with screen size. Previously, it was at constant pixel size. So you pick a reference resolution, uh, and you say how you want it to match, in this case, width or height, and equally between both so that regardless of whether it's taller or wider, everything scales as you'd expect. And then I start the project. And now my text all kind of looks right. And if I change the resolution, like the texts are all the same size and they're laid out properly, I can make this uh, free aspect ratio and take it here and move it around. Um, I could do a little more work to make sure that things don't get too far away. But uh, for my purposes in this demo, that was all I needed. So uh, definitely want to use that. <laughs> that is your relationship saver. <laughs> The next thing you really want to know about the UI system is how the rect transform works. And this is uh, because in my teaching it to some of our customers, it took me a couple of times to fully grasp how it all uh, interacted with each other and how all these pieces worked. So the rect transform is made of anchors, which are represented by the little triangles in the four corners. And that's a relative position to the parent and control points, which define where your element actually is. And that's a fixed distance from, it's an absolute distance from those anchors and a pivot, which is a relative position to your control points. And that's where all of your uh, scaling and your rotation are going to come from that you see in the inspector window on the right side here. So the main thing to, the, like the, the phrase that I put together so that I could go to customers and say, OK, this is how you remember it. Uh, is anchors are a percentage within the parent element. The control points are a fixed distance from the anchors. And the pivot is a percentage between the control points. As you can see in the inspector window here, uh, you see on the top, you've got your, uh, your control points defined, left, top, right, bottom. And those, those are, see, so 100 pixels. So this, this edge of the element here is 100 pixels from that uh, left edge of the anchors and top and right and bottom as well. And the pivot points, yeah, so and the, uh, the anchors are 20% in from the parent element and then 80%, which is 20% from the other side in both directions too. And then the pivot is halfway between those control points and that's how it all comes together. There is uh, one side case when any of those anchor points are together. Uh, instead, you're, it's not left, top, right, and bottom. If, if the x's are together, then it's defined by an x posi position and a width around that position. Same with the y. If the y anchors are together, then it's defined by a y position and a height around those anchors. Uh, so just be aware of that, because it actually does look different in the editor. And I can actually show that here. Don't save that. So if I, if I take my anchors of this uh, panel element here, and we have a handy little box here that makes it quick. I can just go click this guy and say, be in the middle. Now we see that the x position is defined by a position, which is 0, in the middle, and then a width around that position, which is the width of that element. Same with the y, 0 and a height. 
Um, and that, that, that's probably part of some of the confusion, because I know that kind of got me. I was like, why is this all of a sudden like different values and different labels, and what's that mean? So. All right, chapter three, understanding your partner's motivations. This part of a relationship, this is when you need to know uh, what makes your partner tick, what drives them, what are their priorities, and how do they prioritize those. Uh, and I'm gonna let Phil, the relationship guru, take over this one. Um, so the main thing that the Canvas actually does is it batches your UI elements together. Um, now what do I mean by batching? It takes all the same elements that have the same texture and same material and tries to put them in one draw call if it can. If it can't put it together, it creates extra draw calls, and then too many of those, your performance gets, starts going down. Now, what do I mean by the same texture? Now, remember, images use sprites. Um, so by default, those get packed into an atlas, and then that atlas is that single texture. So if it's on the same texture atlas, it will be the same texture. And as long as you haven't overridden the material on the image, it will, by default, be the same material. Text, on the other hand, is always a different atlas. So if you have an image followed by text, those, just by the defaults on how systems work, have to be two different draw calls. They cannot be batched together. So in this case, it would separate it. But say you had two different elements on different corners of the screen, both sharing the same texture background and then text on top. Because they are not overlapping, those two background images can be batched together and the two text elements can be batched together. So in that case, it'd be a lot quicker. A um, little bit later. Oh, jumped the gun on that one. Yes, you did. <laughs> So how does our backend actually work? So in 5.2, we actually threaded our backend batching system. Um, now, what do I mean by threaded? Well, obviously, if you know what multi-threading is, that's exactly what we did. We took all our sorting code on how we figured out what goes into what batch and made it into quick little threads that can just execute when there's time so we don't block the main thread. So the first thing we do is we generate renderable UI instructions. Now, you'll probably see there's the UI geometry job and stuff like that. There's a lot of copying of data going on here. What this first one does is takes the canvas renderer's data, which has actually gone into a different data set on the back end, and it copies it. Why does it copy it? Because of threading. How Unity works is we can actually, while we're rendering a frame, which this is part of the rendering, we can start processing the next frame. So if we don't copy the data, we could be modifying that Canvas renderer's information while we're trying to use it. And as you probably can guess, that's a very, very bad idea. So we copy all the instructions over. The other thing that this does is figures out what instructions we can actually render. Is the alpha zero? No point rendering, no point considering it any further. Drop it is the size zero. Same thing, there's nothing to render, might as well drop it and not consider it any further. Um, has it been called by a rec mass 2D? So it's outside of the calling area. Might as well drop it and not consider it any further. Uh, and there's a couple other internal checks just to make sure our pointers are valid and all that sort of stuff. Because um, possibly we lost the material somewhere along the road for whatever reason. We want to make sure we don't process data any further on stuff that we can't actually process. So once that job's done, we allow the next job to run. Now, this could be right after. This could be after the threading system actually gives us the process back. And this is where we actually sort all the batching stuff. Um, so we sort everything into buckets. I will actually get into the buckets a little bit later um, because I actually want to show an example and I don't want to break this workflow. Once we've sorted the stuff and we know what order everything can be rendered in, we prepare the batch jobs. Now this is actually preparing our renderable UI instructions to be passed to the graphics device 
for a little bit further processing. Again, we need to copy it so we can actually process things. And sorry, I'm looking at my notes because I don't actually touch this code all that often because it's stable. Um, yeah. And then the last thing we do is a UI geometry job. In this job, we're actually transforming the vertices. Uh, what else are we doing in this thing? Um, and we modify colors and apply lighting if necessary. By modified colors, I mean if you, your color space is gamma and everything was done in linear, we have to obviously switch it. Otherwise, the UI is going to look completely wrong. Then you'll bug me and go, hey, it's broken. Why? Um, so that's what that job does. Once the UI geometry job has finished, it actually, there's two different scenarios. If it's an overlay canvas, the canvas actually renders the data directly to the graphics card itself. It doesn't wait on anything else. Well, sorry, it waits till the end of the frame after everything else is drawn, but it doesn't insert itself into the regular geometry queue. The world space and the overlay camera, or screen space camera, sorry, actually insert themselves into the camera's render queue and gets further processed to be sorted with all the other world geometry that you have. So if you can get away with it and you don't need lighting, overlay canvas is probably the fastest thing because we don't have to wait on anything else. Unity's not doing extra processing on it. So if you can, it's great. But that's also why overlay does not support lighting. We don't want to introduce extra parameters into the render pipeline of rendering the canvas to have lighting. So back to the sorting buckets. Basically what these are is how many of you have heard of an oak tree? OK, not very many. Um, so basically, we're not doing a full definition of an oak tree. It's close. And this is where you can switch the slides. <laughs> so I'm doing this on the fly, kind of hacking Unity's scene a little bit. So if I create a canvas, of course you have a Mac. Um, did the grid lines show up at all on that? A little bit? So you know the Unity grid lines? Pretend each one of those is a bucket. Um, so if I were to create a UI image, let's make it a little bigger. As you can see, it covers multiple buckets. So it covers three buckets on the Y, and one, two, and five buckets on the X. So when we're actually processing and sorting, we go through all the rendable instructions and figure out what buckets these elements land in. If it doesn't land in the same bucket as something else, fine. We don't actually have to process that. But if it's in the same bucket with something else, we do a little bit of extra processing on it. We go, OK, what's your depth? So if it's higher in the hierarchy, it's going to have a lower depth. If it breaks the material, or it breaks our batch, so material and texture, then we increase the depth value, and we go on to the next element. So our buckets consist of all the elements in that region in the order that they can actually be drawn. It's perfectly fine if there's two elements in the same bucket at the same value. It just means we can batch them together. The order that they're in that list actually matters. Um, it just means that we don't have to do some extra processing on those two elements. We can just take them, copy them to another list. Back to this. So there's a couple common issues that I'm constantly getting bug reports on and constantly closing them because they're actually by design currently. Um, and one of them is your elements are not aligned. One common thing I see is now maybe the artists, because they like visuals, they change things on the Z. Currently, the sorting job does not handle things that are not coplanar to the canvas. And there's a very good reason for this. That reason is if you say you're rendering the canvas with a perspective camera, you move something in the Z, say, closer to the camera, it's obviously going to be bigger. 
that means that the bounds that we use to calculate where it lands in the bucket is dependent on that camera and that final position. When we calculate everything, we don't have a camera to compare against. We have no idea what its final size is going to be. What that causes is a break in the batch, such that we know for sure this is going to be rendered in the proper order. Now, you may be saying, oh, but it's the same as this. They can batch together. Possibly. But how do I know that your image doesn't overlap text because it's now closer in the final mesh that's generated? So, easiest solution select all your UI elements, put it back to zero. How are you going to notice this? Just take a look at your draw call count or go to the frame debugger. You will see that your draw call counts. If you're doing this all over the place, easily in the hundreds if you have a fairly moderate UI system. So just select them all, change the Z back to zero, or some same value. I don't really care if they're coplanar exactly with the canvas, it doesn't really matter. Just make sure they're all the same.、Um, and to kind of illustrate this, I can quickly show you what I mean. So if it's here, I create two. I create two buttons. We'll make them a little bit bigger.、Um, not too worried that you can't see the word text, but believe me, it says button like it does usually when it's created. If I duplicate that. So, what I'll often see, is if I take this out of 2D, so I'll see the artist take the text and I'll move it closer to the camera. Visually, it doesn't look any different. But if I have both these buttons with the text a little bit closer to the camera, oops, wrong one. If I take a look at the game view and I take a look at the stats, you'll see that the batches are five. Yes, it's off screen for some reason, but that's what you get for doing it live. <laughs>、um, so the batches are five. If I take all these elements, Put the Z back to zero. And if Unity actually refreshes, draw calls back down to three. You might be asking why three? Remember, there's a clear frame.、Um, and then I think that then there's one for the image and then one for the text. So if you want to clear your buffer, you kind of need that first draw call. The next most common issue. Is people like, oh, I'm using the sprites and images, and they should be batching together, but they're not. Double check that you've, one, turned on sprite atlasing, two, you've actually specified the packing tag as the same packing tag. The other thing to be concerned about is make sure one's not on MIP map, or、um, I forget what the other properties are. But if the properties don't match, the, The batching or the atlas system creates different atlases, which, as you know, different textures, so they can't batch together. So, any UI elements should have more or less the same import settings、um, and the same packing tag within reason. Thank you, Phil. All right, moving on to chapter four action.、Uh, in your relationships, Uh, there comes a point where you're going to figure out what are the things that you do together and, and how do you do those things. For instance,、uh, do you wash the dishes before you throw them in the dishwasher or do you just rinse them off? I mean, it's called a dishwasher, right? I, I never understood why my aunt always has to wash them all.、Uh, or which, roll, which way does the toilet paper roll go? go? Does it roll over the top or underneath?、Uh, by the way, the answer to that is over the top every time, unless you have kids or pets. <laughs> That's the only excuse for putting it under. So,、uh, to define how we, do, how we take action、uh, in our relationship with, with you, GUI,、uh, I am going to walk you through a little bit of event scripting. Do we switch? All right. So, Unity makes it really easy、uh, by default to, to hook up a default event in a UI element. For a button here, example, for example, Uh, you have an on click method. So in the inspector, you can say,、uh, I'm going to add an on click handler. I have this, this event handler object over here, so I'm going to use that.
uh, you drag that event handler object into this slot here. And now the functions you have exposed are all of the, the public functions on that object. Uh, for instance, this, uh, you can use game object and uh, set active if you want to for some reason. But I wrote some scripts here. So my event handler, handle button click. Easy, right? Now when I hit play, I can click that button, and it starts responding to that click. And as you can see in the code, uh, that's all I'm doing here. Just quick debug statement. Uh, but that's going to be kind of tedious if I want to do this for all of the buttons in this grid. I have to go into each one and select it. Um, maybe I can multi-select them and do it all at one time, but what if they're in different areas and I have to go track them all down in the hierarchy? Um, and then do that on each one, too. So one other thing you can do is uh, in your scripts, you can, um, for instance, you can make a list of buttons, or you can write a function to find all of the buttons you're looking for in the, in the code. Uh, and then um, and then uh, add a listener to the onClick method. So what I'm going to do here is, and by the way, I did not know you could do this <laughs> until he showed me last night. And I'm going to select this event handler, and what he's talking about here is I'm going to lock the inspector. So now it's, it's locked to showing that event handler, so now I can select anything else in the hierarchy, and it's not going to change. Um, you can do that, and you can actually also add uh, another inspector if you want, and that one's not locked. Just pro tip. Um, every time I go to a customer and teach them and show them that, there's someone there that has never done that before. Uh, and I hadn't, as of like a year ago, it blew my mind. So I'm going to take all of these buttons and drop them into this array. Um, as you know, in Unity, if you've ever done this, there's no particular order that I can tell from how it adds it. But in this case, it doesn't matter. Uh, in my script, I'm going to just go through all of them and add a listener. Uh, handed, handle scripted button click, which is going to just output a different debug message. So now I can hit play. And every one of these buttons is now wired up with that event. Uh, and this first button is actually wired up with both of them because I never removed that first event handler in the inspector or in the editor. Um, so that's how you can wire up a lot of buttons to specific functions or certain buttons to other functions, however you want to do that in script. That's, that's up to you. Um, let's go back to the slides again real quick for the next one. So you can also uh, handle dynamic events. So what, what I was just showing you was a static event. Um, and that's when you just pass a string, an int, something that you defined, and that value is whatever you've, you've passed it. Uh, dynamic events uh, are things that, Unity, that when the event triggers, there's data that's involved in that event, and that gets sent to you. Um, if there's any other detail, Phil, that you that I missed on that particular point. Yeah, so if I just quickly go back to the button, um, if I can unlock your inspector. If I take a quick look at the button as well. Have any of you ever wondered why like, the button says unclick with just the parentheses? And then if I were to have like, a scroll bar, it would say on value changed with a single in there. Well, the difference between those is one's the stat, or those are the dynamic values that this function is going to accept. So under the dynamic list, it will only show you the functions that will actually match that parameter call stack, or those parameters. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of the button, no data is being passed to the button, so the onClick method can't pass anything on. In, on value, in the sliders on value changed, it can pass the new value to you. So it knows about it, so you can do it that here. Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll do this. So uh, just to give you another example of that, you can listen for other events besides just the default one. Uh, and to do that, you add an event trigger, and then you click Add New Event Type. And you have a list of all the different event types that you can listen for. Uh, in this case, I'm going to listen for drag. And as you notice, there's base event data, which means that this mm -hmm. event trigger is going to get a class called base event data passed to it from the event system. And when I add a listener here, you can see that there's no, there's no parameter that it's waiting for here, because we, we don't pass that in. So I'm going to pass the same event handler over to the object here. Uh, look in my function list under my event handler, and you notice that now there's two separate lists, one list for all the static events and one for uh, the, the dynamic ones. 
And I've written this handle dynamic event in there, and I'll show you that real quick. And the only difference here is that I have a parameter base event data data. Um, and all I'm going to do here is cast that data to pointer event data, because I know for drag, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and then I'm going to take the, my button, and I'm going to translate it by the delta of that drag. So just before you continue, yep. open up that drop down again, and yep. go try to select again. If you notice, both under the dynamic and static is that same function. So if you're expecting that dynamic value to be used, make sure you select the dynamic one. You select the static, it's going to pop up a little box below where you can actually populate whatever object you want to pass. In this case, it would just be a null object, and then you're not going to get the data you expect, and then you come bitching to me saying it doesn't work. <laughs> we might have fixed that, because I actually don't see that, that handler here. I don't know. It's supposed to be there. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, so now, uh, where was I here? Um, yeah, now when I play, uh, that first button is the one that I put that on, I think, didn't I? No, you put it on one. Oh, like I put it halfway on halfway down. Button. Oh, which one was that now? Uh, that guy, all right. Uh, no, so not even. That one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now when I, I take that button, and I, I'm using the drag, and I can move it along with my mouse because I'm using the drag value. Uh, and like I said, there's, there's a lot of other events that you can listen for in here. Um, so play with it to your heart's content. Yeah. You also <laughs> don't have to use the event trigger if you don't want to. You can extend your class, um, like drive from I on pointer click, I on drag, or I drag, forgetting all the names. But all those events are actually just populated there because they're derived from an interface class that the event system knows about. So if on your class you want to do a drag event without adding that, by me all means, go for it. That's what you have to do. Uh, and there's one other uh, scripting thing I, want to, I just want to mention really quickly but not go too deeply into. Uh, you can use Lambda functions so that you can pass uh, anonymous functions or other data into, into your events. Um, so you can either do it as up here by just using this syntax to define an anonymous function, an anonymous function and then uh, pass it in there. You can do that. Or the preferred way in Unity is to use this Unity action. And then, uh, so I call this one click handler action. And in the awake function, I assign it to this handle lambda button click here. And now I can pass around this click handler action. Uh, so when I go up here to this version of my, my uh, on-click listeners, I can just pass that Unity action in, uh, and it's already defined. There's a couple of ways to do that. Um, yeah. And then next chapter, chapter five, growing a relationship. Every relationship is going to need to evolve and change uh, and adapt and improve, right? So it's the same thing with the UGUI. Uh, we, there are ways for you to, to fit this relationship to, to your needs, uh, and Phil is going to walk us through that. Um, so as I was saying at the start, uh, the UI source is completely open source. Um, now by me, completely native side's not, back end of Canvas, back end of Canvas renderer, hidden behind the DLL. Everything else, the event system, um, the layout system, buttons, images, all that code is freely available to download, modify however you like. And if there's something in there that you're like, oh, I really want access to this function. Is it there? You go look. Maybe it's private. Don't ask me why. There's a bunch of stuff in the UI system that's private, making it very hard to extend just by adding a script and deriving. By all means, poke me. I'm very receptive to that sort of thing. I don't want to go and do it for absolutely everything. But if you need something protected, chances are, as long as it's reasonable, I will go do it. And then at some later point, you'll get access to it. So cloning of the source repo is just that URL. Um, actually, that won't clone it for you. That's just where it's located. 
You try to clone that, it's going to give you nothing. Um, but if you've ever cloned a repo before, especially if you've cloned a repo from Bitbucket, it kind of walks you through everything. It will tell you the repository URL that you need to clone. You can also download it from there, right? Do we have that option enabled? Possibly. Sure. <laughs> I know I in Bitbucket there's an option to download a lot of times. but Do yeah. you actually have it open by chance? You could just go to the slides and open it. Oh, I could have done that too, yeah. Google is my default for everything. Um, yep, downloads. OK, so he says downloads actually there. So you can just download it directly from there. You don't actually have to do much. It's just going to give you a zip, I guess, yep. Yep, of exactly zip. what it is. Um, and then from there, you can just modify the source. Now, I would almost use this sparingly. If there's some big bug, and for whatever reason, I'm completely ignoring you, and you're like, oh, I'm shipping next week. I need this bug fixed. You can go in and actually modify it yourself. Um, very simple process. All described on the web page. We'll just go back. So this is what you'll see if you go to that URL that I showed you. Um, and it's just, how do I get started? Uh, follow that. It's actually very simple. There's a Visual Studio project, which also opens up in MonoDevelop. You make your change. You right click on either the editor or the UI project. Chances are you want the UI project, unless you're making an editor change. Um, and you just hit build. That will spit out a Unity engine.ui.dll. You take that DLL and you put it at the path specified on the page, depending on if you're on Windows or Mac. Now, th the thing with this is that's for that Unity version. You update your Unity version, you're going to need to do this again. Chances are you're going to need to do it again anyways because the UI source changes, and I make absolutely no guarantees that the API between the versions is actually going to be correct. So if, you have, if you're relying on something, maybe there's a bug in the canvas render and I need to change some functionality, there's no guarantee that the canvas render section that's here is, or the, sorry, the API that the UI system uses is going to match up 100%. Chances are it's going to, but makes absolutely no guarantee. If I need to make changes to make things better, I'm going to do that. Um, so once you put it in there and you're on that Unity version, it's going to override the default Unity engine.ui.dll. So it's going to be using the one you've built. Um, reporting issues, like I said, just poke me. It could be the smallest. Uh, as just changing private to protected. I'll probably not make too many things public. Our public stuff is probably where it needs to be. Um, could be bug fixes. Could be anything. Um, if you've noticed anything wrong with that repo repository, by all means, send me a direct message. Do whatever. Let me know. I've actually had a couple people come back and say, hey, that last push you did completely screwed it up. Could you go fix it? That I take very seriously. I'll do right away. Contributing fixes, we do handle PRs through it. I know it looks like we probably don't if you've looked at the PR list that's on that website. There is 17 PRs I think it's open right now. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that I'm not looking at them. doesn't mean I'm not taking those ideas into consideration. It just means I haven't had time to go and move them over. Now, if you were to contribute a fix and I were to look at the PR, chances are you will see it get denied. That doesn't mean that it's actually been denied. It just means I've taken your code, put it into the main Unity repository, and I'm going to push your fix through that change. I don't want to just put changes into that PR because then it's kind of a merge conf conflict and makes my life easier if I just deny the PR and merge it in a different way. Uh, but you include a message that says, Yes, I'll actually I, put a message yeah, saying yeah. it's actually been approved. Um, but if you see it denied and there's no message saying approved, Chances are it was not actually approved, but I'll say why. Um, and any fixes that you do contribute, I will actually maintain the right to modify them in any way that I feel necessary. So I haven't actually taken one PR exactly how it is. Three years, I've never done it. There's Unity standards that we need to uphold. There's better practices that we try to follow. All depending on that. Depends on the final version that's going to be there. <laughs>